here. So welcome everyone. Um, going to be a great talk this evening. Um, the title of the talk this evening is As Above, So Below, Beneath the Burren with Tim O'Connell. Uh, we'll embark, embark on a short journey beneath the surface of the Burren with this talk, exploring the enduring appeal of the subterranean realm and the interconnectedness between the Burren's above and below worlds. Every step we take on the surface can echo through the spaces below. Tim is a caver and conservationist living and working in and for the Burren. Uh, with a love for exploring the subterranean, Tim dedicates himself to the conservation of the Burren's unique landscape, both above and below ground. He's an advocate for adventure, community, and nature in this incredible lived land, uh, landscape. So without further ado, I will welcome Tim for the the cave talk tonight. Thanks very much, Lee. Uh, uh, that's, a, <laughs> that's a substantial um, introduction there. Hope, hopefully I'm going to live up. Um, that's uh, that's tough going, <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do. Uh, you can hear me, first of all, just double checking on that. It's been a while since I've used Zoom, and uh, I'm going to share the screen now, and we'll make sure that works first before I go too much further. Uh, So can you see that screen okay, looking good? And okay, Lee, you're muted there, I presume it's okay. Yeah, thumbs up, okay, great stuff. Um, thank you very much um, for for coming on this evening. Um, thanks very, very much, Lee, for the invite. Uh, and thanks to your colleagues with, with uh, for Burn Bio as well. It's really, really nice to be asked, actually. Um, I've, I've given these talks or something akin to them once 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 in a while for for the last the last while uh, um, so it's good it's good every now and then to to get a an opportunity to kind of to step back from something that's, that's such a such a part of life and uh, to kind of reflect on it in this in this way to get a get a get a bit of perspective from it so it's it's much appreciated and uh, it's it's been an enjoyable enjoyable experience to reflect and try and put words on something that is a difficult task to put words on i think i think myself sometime um so I've I've run through this talk a couple of times and it'll I, I'll take probably the next uh, 30 35 minutes maybe 40 minutes or so just in a in a vain attempt perhaps to bring to bring the caves of the burn to you and uh, perhaps to bring you to the caves of the burn a little bit in in so much as I can do that in this in this format um, but before I before I launch into it before I launch into the meat and potatoes of it uh, I'm going to give a few caveats I'm, I'm not a geologist, I'm not an archaeologist, I'm not a hydrogeologist, I'm not any of those things. I'm very, very much just an amateur, uh, an amateur explorer uh, with, with a couple of cave leader qualifications and cave specific qualifications. But in terms of the sciences, um, I'm, I'm a map maker uh, and not, uh, not, a, not a geologist or an archaeologist. Um, so apologies if I misrepresent any any theory uh, or any of the science. And if I do, please, please do point it out to me here or elsewhere. I'm, I'm here to learn as well. Um, and so I've been caving frequently for about 20 years. Uh, it doesn't feel like it, but it's been uh, probably 20 years at this point. Very much mostly in the burn and based in the burn. And I've been so for the last 20 years. I've caved a little bit beyond the burn, um, but mostly here and mostly with the Clare Cave Club and, and more on those guys uh, later on. So away we go. I hope. Are we going to go away? We are. Can you? That's, that's okay. Okay. Um, so I've I've given talks on caves in the past, as I was saying to Lee before we started there, I've, I've given talks in the past once every, every year or two. And I do I do find it a tricky a tricky to topic to communicate? Um, to be honest, um, in informal situations or quasi formal situations like this, or or informally um, with with family or friends or, or wider wider social circles, um, it's it's strange. I, caves are one of those places that people have very very strong associations with, uh, and it often it surprises me how how strongly people feel about them, um, and <laughs> even are, are just reject the idea of ever visiting one. Even if it is, if the idea of a visit isn't on the table, uh, it, it's it's uh, it's it's fu it's funny how strongly people feel about them, um, and uh, and are, are have kind of feelings 
good, bad, or indifferent. Um, so the type of positive associations that people might have um, with the, uh, for the caves are often, you'd hear people talk about awe, reverence, um, you know, with peacefulness, place of retreat, uh, perhaps a place of insight, um, or if, if you're into psychoanalysis, it, it's often used, the kind of Jungian type thing, the unknown parts of our mind. Um, and, you know, these are the kind of things that people have that associate with caves, perhaps on the on the on the more sublime and the more positive and the more beautiful side. Uh, and some of us ha do have uh, first hand memories of caves. Maybe maybe uh, people went to show cave when they were younger or as part of a trip. Uh, and if you have been, you'll, you'll know that when you go into a cave for the first time, uh, even even in those very, very controlled environments, it's it's a very interesting experience. People often, and I was very, the first time I went into Aloe, and that was the first cave I went into when I was a kid, I was very much aware of the, just, just the weight of the rock over our heads. And it's, it's just this incredible um, idea, you know, where all, most of the structures, all the structures we spend our times in are uh, human built structures. Um, and and uh, that's what we're, we're familiar with, things that have been engineered and stress tested. Uh, so the, the idea that this is a natural space and that is self-sustaining and ha that holds this incredible burden of rock over our heads, that it's an amazing thing. Uh, and it's it's a memory we carry. And there's also that lovely moment for some where, when if you were lucky enough that the guide turned off the lights and uh, you got that thick velvety darkness and you, got, you had that experience where you can see your, your hand in front of your face, a lovely thing. So there are some of the positive associations. On the negative side, an awful lot of people straight, straight off the bat say, I'm claustrophobic. Um, and uh, I'll tell you, I've brought many, many, many people caving over the last over the last couple of decades, and it's very, very rare that people truly experience something like that. I, um, I could count them on less than the fingers of one hand, but it's definitely an idea that we do carry around. It's there somewhere in our psyche, you know. This this fear of the dark, uh, often symbolized by caves or caves used as a as a metaphor. We've seen it in the movies. We've seen people being lost. We've, uh, you know, we kind of associate it perhaps with helplessness, being totally vulnerable uh, and uh, afraid in the dark. Um, you know, so these these fears that perhaps are latent in the back of our heads somewhere, uh, this fear of the dark. These little fears have been inflamed definitely by an in, by an entertainment industry, and uh, and there, so people's experiences of caves are probably more based on these more so than based on first hand or re real experience. And um, but they're the associations that pe some people do carry. Um, so whatever else I say this evening, and I'll go through a couple of things. This is the one thing I do want you to take away with, and I will mention it again later on. Whatever I say here this evening, or whatever other experiences you may have, or think what you think you know about caves, um, you know, don't don't take them as true. It's one of those things in life that are definitely experienced in the first in in the first hand in the real world before before you draw conclusions uh, and so as i've said i've i've kind of struggled in the past to 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 communicate to communicate some of this uh, and for for the night that's in it it's Valentine's Day. Um, I'm going to treat this as a, as a 20 year relationship. I'm not going to go too too sciency. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go too too far into it. But I'm going to talk about it as a, a 20 year evolving relationship. With apologies to the other loves in my life, as it's Valentine's Day, I do love the caves. I'm going to talk about them as as a as a, a thing that I love. Um, so it's been an unfolding 20 year relationship and a, a deep with a deepening affection and love, and I've, I've kind of broken those into three or four phases here. So I'm going to present to you the caves as as I encountered them for the first time, that that first encounter. Uh, and then the perhaps the honeymoon period that you go through where everything is everything is wonderful and excellent. And then perhaps a deepening respect and care as, as time goes on. So we'll move on to the next one. Um, okay. Ah yes, lovely. So this is um McDoah's Hermitage. Um, you, you might know if you're familiar with the burn um, Kill McDoah. This is uh, McDoua's Hermitage up near Eagles Rock, Keela Hilla, at the foot of Sleeve Caron there. An absolutely wonderful short walk, um, one of my favourite places in the Burren. Um, a short walk into the Holy Well and the church um, and across some fantastic, bur typical Burren winterage landscape. And uh, you come into this um, 
you come into the, the foot of this the, this little hillock, which is covered in hazel scrub with the Boulogne stone at the bottom of it. And a very, very short, maybe a, a 10 meter hike up past the Boulogne stone brings you to this wonderful little cleft in the rock. It's not an awful lot deeper than what we see here behind, uh, behind Sheila and Izzy in the photograph. It's just a, a little short cave, no specialist equipment needed, no, um, no special skill needed but it's an absolutely fantastic place to sit uh, and just look out at the, the view. And you can, you can easily imagine the saint peaceful sitting here, uh, peaceably sitting while his cousin, uh, Guire, King Guire, was up in Kinvara, uh, you know, weary with the burden of power in his castle. And uh, 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 Macdua was sitting here. I've, I've spent one night here many, 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 many uh, years ago uh, over, over a winter. And it's, it was absolutely wonderful looking out at the stars from this. Just can't imagine a place more peaceful and people do leave votive objects and uh, and that kind of thing here. It's people people have a lot of affection for this place, and um, so one of those places I recommend to go if you're if you're lucky enough to be able to access the burn to go and see this place firsthand to get your own firsthand experience of a cave. Okay, something a little bit more daunting, perhaps here you'll definitely need some equipment, a light source, perhaps a ladder, and some stout boots, stout boots, and sensible clothes. Um, so this photograph taken in the 1930s when the caves began to be mapped in, in earnest uh, and uh, although they would have been known before this by locals and there is records going back to the, 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 late, um, the late 19th century of locals entering, entering caves, this is when they became known to the sciences. Um, and what the original explorers felt prior to going in is probably similar enough to what the novice caver feels like um, today, you know, facing into the unknown. What am I going into here? Will I be physically able? Is there going to be risk? Uh, I wonder what I'm going to see. And um, this is Palma Gollum, um, the longest cave in, in the, on the island of Ireland, 20 kilometers and counting, still sections of it being um, being explored today and being being extended. So that length is is growing. And although it's, it's uh, hard to see, there are three cave entrances in this. There's Shaft Gallery down to the left hand side, Baker's Rift up to the right and Gunman's down to the down to the down to the the right hand side, sorry, shaft, shaft gallery on the left, gunmen so called because there was weaponry um, found there after the the war, of this the civil war, possibly used in the either the war of independence or the civil war, and doesn't the photograph look absolutely tropical? You know, the, it's it's hard to believe, and sometimes when you see photographs like this, that this is the burn. These these caves are, the cave entrances are often microbiomes that support some fantastic biodiversity all by themselves, and uh, they're they're well known for being uh, roosts for protected species such as less. Or horseshoe and some of them are, are protected with uh, with that in mind lesser horseshoe in particular so before we just launch ourselves underground i just want to do a quick comparison if you think about it if you're a kayaker or a mountaineer you're going to head off to the iron islands for a day from from doolan pier in your kayak you see the whole journey laid out in front of you you know you're going to be paddling for two hours perhaps to get out two hours to get back or even more it's maybe less if you're really good um but this this is different. Your field of vision is completely closed. And if you haven't visited this cave before, even if you're not, um, even if you're somewhat experienced, if you're coming to a previously unvisited site by you, you can feel this wonderful sense of vulnerability as you move towards a cave, a cave entrance and uh, out of the greenery and the open sky and into the cave. Uh, so we're just inside the entrance. You can imagine the nervous anticipation that you've felt before you come in changes now, that nervous trepidation giving way. Your imagination settles a bit and your eyes adjust to the dark slowly. There's a very distinctive, beautiful, rocky smell and uh, the colours are muted. The sounds are amplified. You can hear nearly every crinkle of your clothing as you move and drops of water, which you've never noticed in the world above, take on a much larger significance. Um, and perhaps you know you start to notice the shapes of the passage. They, they can have some incredible weaving, uh, weaving shapes. Uh, maybe small little precipices jutting out. The roof that you that you might worry about has disappeared over your head, uh, and you can you get these incredible formations. You know these small delicate shapes. What we're looking at here is some straws, which are the larger five features hanging down with really delicate helic tights projecting out at their bases. Uh, very, very brittle, and you'd break if you brush off them. This, this, these places are, are vulnerable, delicate places of their own right. And it's water in its element interacting with the rock, corroding it and making the passages and building it up at the same time by making these wonderful foundations. So all that nervous energy dissipates for a lot of people with the second they get into the cave and they go, ah, oh, this is amazing. 
ale uh, is uh, the Irish for stalactite, which which literally means uh, lime frost. And I think this this grainy photograph uh, captures it well. This it is like this wonderful, delicate frost hanging off the hanging off the ceiling. You know, it does look like icicles, uh, and each of those can be easily snapped or broken if you reach up. So we absolutely don't do that. And it's such a, a sanctuary of a place, a sanctuary for nature to be nature to get to places like this. Uh, and we, as cavers, we can only kind of visit briefly and appreciate them and be very, very humbled, but not stay for very long. And we head back head out perhaps or onto a different section of the cave. Uh, just to say very quickly, this is not the burn. <laughs> this is uh, uh, the largest um, column formation of calcite, calcium carbonate in, in the world, I believe. It's in Nurha cave, I visited there recently. Uh, so given enough space and enough time this is what uh, what calcite, uh, water, water, and rock can do together. These absolutely incredible cathedral like like um, like shapes. Now I'm not going to dwell on it too long because it's not in the burn, but who knows? Could be something similar in a yet to be discovered cavern in the burn. That's one of the wonderful things about caving. There's a lot of unknowns yet to be discovered, so who knows? Um, Uf. Um, Uf is the Irish word for cave, but it, it, I find it often references a cave passage more so than the, the cave, uh, more so than a, a cavern. Um, so some people and think that caves uh, are teeny tiny or they're incy wincy, and, and some of them are, but a lot of them aren't. This is Doolin River Cave. Uh, there, you can see the river has eroded down this um, this huge big stomping passage um, and you know a wonderful walk uh, and a, a pretty pretty impressive river uh, so just to just to reassure people that who thought these were all kind of tiny little snake like worm like passages some of them are, are, are substantial enough and this cave goes on for uh, quite a quite a long time it's a long system um, okay so this is a lovely photograph again Doolin, Doolin River Cave uh, with apologies to any geologists listening, and this will be my only attempt uh, at, a, at attempt mine to explain cave formation. Um, so the cave begins to form at the top of the picture. You'll have to imagine everything below the red line being uh, being absolutely solid rock, where Tim, other Tim, is in is in the picture there. Um, back when the cave, in the early days of the cave being formed, um, where Tim was standing, is completely solid rock, and the, the water is just trickling around is is pushing pushing its way through these tiny little um channels up the top of the picture um at the early stage of speleogenesis and as time moves on the water etches its way down and uh, corrodes out the 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 it's the water if it's if it's coming in is mildly acidic and it corrodes the 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 alkali um limestone and slowly slowly erodes it away and it washes out over a very 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 long period of time um, and that's that's the direction of travel as the cave slowly was eroded down with some of those rocks being left behind and leaving this incredible um void behind it uh, which we're which we're so so lucky to have so although many caves in the the burren are geologically young perhaps 10,000 years old or so uh, many are multi-phase and much older possibly Doolin River cave um which probably is um as far as far as I know um the conjecture is that it's it's much older I don't know if it's absolutely known that it's much older and isn't that a wonderful thing in and of its old right uh, it's an exciting very exciting time to be a geologist there's lots of new methodologies to work with there's lots of new science uh, and uh, opening up new potential ways we hope in future to find to, to find caves that we know perhaps are there because uh, there's no surface water we know water is moving through the landscape um, so it's a very exciting time to be a geologist, and I believe Colin Bunce has done some wonderful talks uh, for Burham Bio. I know he has some talks online, and I would encourage people to seek those out to see some of these new um, new sciences and methodologies being applied. It's it's like being a kid in a sweet shop if you're a geologist at the moment. It's a golden age of discovery. And now we're gone back out of the burn for a brief interlude again for the next slide or two. This is um, the Mendips in the UK, um, so uh, in, in near Bristol in the south, south of England. Uh, and this is a cavern, a ploish, also used for a den, the word for den, a cavern. And uh, I can tell you, we in the last 20 years, the light sources we have used have utterly changed. When I started caving, people were still using carbide light, which is what miners used to use, which is a small little, like a very bright candle, which sits atop your helmet. 
some people were still using those and some people were using halogen lights. Uh, and obviously now we have these blisteringly powerful LED lights that have um, that have become down in cost and increased in strength dramatically. Uh, and even still, even still these lights that are that are like a, the, the headlights of a car, you can put them up to full full bore and you're still going to walk into a chamber like this and see these absolutely powerful lights just dissipate into nothingness at the at, at the back of these chambers and it's just just amazing it's, so, it's such a humbling experience to be in these huge spaces that are honestly like a cathedral um or honestly like like the nave of a church they're just absolutely vast uh, and it, it's and it's not everyone that obviously wants to go to these places uh, and it's, it's just so humbling to to be able to come into them and to feel so pleasantly small um so each region's caves have a kind of a look and a feel uh, which differs substantially depending on local conditions such as the the way the limestone is formed and the way the limestone is fractured or has fa it falls in the landscape uh, and the way the the water moves in the landscape or the altitude all these things and the the, the temperature as well all these things impact the, the the potential um way the cave is going to form um so it's it's a wonderful thing to be able to to go and visit these other spaces um and this is another place again not in the burn this is over in the pyrenees in france pierre saint martin uh, an absolutely vast cave a clear caving club, club trip from a few years ago there and when you're in places like this it doesn't even feel like planet earth anymore you know you could be on another planet with these just ridiculously voluminous um very very large spacious chambers um, it's it's incredible to, to go visit them but the savage loves his native shore so we're going to go very quickly away from these back to the burn as i said as the man said there's uh, there's many churches but there's only one cathedral and the, the burn is the cathedral um so back to the burn and so things to do in a cave i've we've introduced the cave in and of itself and we're going to move on to to phase two now which is kind of the more exploratory phase so we've um beyond the initial introduction so a couple of things to do in a cave or things typically that people might do walking. Um, so again, just to reassure people, uh, there's that you don't go in and start immediately crawling, writhing around in your belly like a snake or, or, or any of that stuff. Typically, most of the time you're going to spend in a cave is walking. Uh, and Werner Herzog uh, said that the world only makes sense to me when, when I when I walk and I, I can I, that rings true with me. And especially in the caves, um, it, they only make sense if you if you walk it, walk in them. And you can imagine uh, the walking this gentleman would have been would have been doing and that we all we all do when we're in cave and you know this Lee from when we when we went out caving before you're not walking in a straight line plowing down as if you're walking down a pavement or, or, a, or a road you're you're moving kind of side to side in this very in this uh, you know you're going to drop your shoulders you're going to be on the lookout for your head bumping off something perhaps down in your hands and knees for a second back up switch sides walk around walk uh, walk slowly for a little bit trudging through the river you have to you have to stoop you have to bend your head you have to be aware of your surroundings you have to move uh, and it's often like a like a lovely like a lovely stretching session when you come out uh, and i know an occupational therapist that says it's very good for your vestibular system I'm not sure what that means exactly but uh, I'll, I'll take it as only a good thing and it's a very strange strange way to move and a very pleasing way to move uh, and a very present way to move when you're when you're walking in a cave um not an accident this is a, a black slide and i put this in here because of course one of the wonderful things to do one of the best things to do in a cave is to turn off the lights and just sit or go for a walk and sit if you know that there's no obstacles ahead of you there's no pitfalls you're not they're not going to hit your head if, you, if this is a section of the cave that you know well uh you're you're going to be able to turn off your lights perhaps with one hand on a wall and walk slowly and carefully it is an experience like no other i can guarantee you that it is amazing and all the more meaningful in this day and age when we're so connected and we're so welded to our phones and welded to, to connectivity um it's just so special to have a place that you you must disconnect because you have no choice here um you know you're not going to be checking any messages you're not going to be doing anything you don't even have your phone um it's it's just wonderful to stop and turn off your light and sit there for a half an hour and uh, listen to nothing and everything at the same time such a pleasure and uh, such a such a rare experience and uh, cannot recommend it highly enough okay 
um, crawling. Yes, there's crawling. <laughs> I often get given out to for em emphasizing the tougher stuff in the, in the caves. Uh, this is what made me a caver. I absolutely love doing doing a little short crawl. And uh, this this one on the left hand, this photograph on the left hand side is Mira. Uh, she this is an optional crawl. She could have walked, but she decided to to do this short crawl instead. And you can see uh, she's absolutely ecstatic coming coming out of that. And I, I just love the love the joy in her face there. Again, another experience which is great fun. Uh, and uh, it, I definitely have a lot of affection for these short crawls. Uh, it's it's lovely. Uh, and on the right hand side, getting to remoter sections of the cave, um, perhaps to take a photograph of something that hasn't been photographed before, visiting a certain passage that you that you haven't had a chance to visit in the past, perhaps seeing a particular formation, uh, or perhaps uh, map doing doing a mapping exercise and mapping a piece, or even ex looking for a, a new place to explore. All of these things can be focal points of a trip. And uh, obviously, we're very we're super, super careful uh, not to go tromping across uh, formations like these, these beautiful pristine calcite formations. Uh, if people walk across these with a big muddy boot, perhaps the water won't be able to wash away um, the air imprint. So they're extremely fragile spaces and uh, people have to be really, really careful coming into these. And just to, I'll take this moment to say I'm not a great cave photographer by any means. Uh, so a lot of the photographs here I've I've nicked and I've uh, I've thanks to the people I've I have borrowed them from or stolen them from. Uh, I've credited you at the end. Um, caves are drains. Uh, the burn doesn't have a huge amount of surface water in the in the uplands, uh, so the the water moves through these systems and it does fluctuate. It does up and go up and down, and it can be in unavoidable. I love that photograph of Shane Diffley getting a face full of a, a small small cold river, uh, nice and nice and refreshing. And um, so the cave water do fluctuate, and obviously cavers are are careful to go in to the certain caves. You would absolutely not go if there's heavy rain forecast or if it's been heavily raining. Uh, so local knowledge is key. Um, when going into these places and if we cannot um, walk or, or crawl to a place perhaps there's some protection needed using ropes and ladders caving is very much a group activity it's it'd be very unusual vanishingly unusual for someone to go on their own into a cave um, so it's a group activity and we, it's very much a team activity and small tight-knit teams of three four five wouldn't be unusual for a trip and a great bonding experience too so getting towards the more, more adventurous side of things here, um, in the last 30 to 50 years, a, a technique uh, borrowed from um, industrial rope access, you know, called, we call single rope technique, has been developed and honed and uh, simplified and, and it makes more safe accessible to these places that were accessible, inaccessible 30 years ago, perhaps. Uh, Arthur going into Powell McGollum, Bally Shani on the left, and uh, I love that photograph of Paul, uh, Paul Murphy going down into Powell Elva, another fantastic 35 meter deep entrance uh, into, into um, Powell McGollum on the right hand side. I love the I love that photograph. And obviously a specialist skill. Um, okay, the mud. We have to mention the mud. Um, caving can be a thinly veiled excuse, as you can see from Quentin on the right hand side, to go wallowing around in mud. Mud is fantastic. And what else would you be doing on a Sunday? Um, obviously, this isn't everyone's idea of a, of a great time, and it's not something that uh, everyone partakes in every Sunday as a caver. But perhaps you're going to a, a new area of a cave to look for look for something that is a, a blank area on the map that has the potential to to offer new passage that has yet to be seen, or you want to go to a particular area that you must go through some of this. And uh, yeah, that can be that can be part of it. No point in saying it doesn't in in some caves. And on the left hand side, um, this is Brian who has perhaps been given a tip off that this little cleft in the rock uh, might have a, a sound of echoing trickling water on the inside and uh, it may yield a as yet unknown cave or it may yield an as yet unknown entrance into a, an existing cave or an extension to an existing cave who knows the burn is full of these these type of features and uh, you'll often see cavers with permission of course going into these uh, rare nooks and crannies and terraces um, of the of the burn to try and find find a brand spanking new cave, and uh, and that does yield its successes from time to time. Um, some of these are a bit dated now, but this is a fantastic discovery from the burn. Uh, and again, Burn Dio has done talks on this particular thing in detail in the past from Palma Gonzo in Carron and County Clare. Gonzo was uh, Sean Shannon's dog, and who went into this little hollow. 
um, back in 2006 and he flagged it up at a local caver, Colin Bunce, and uh, we came and we dug out, pulled out some boulders over a few evenings over a winter and uh, came into this brand new, as yet unknown to science, um, uh, cave which is a beautiful deep system which has this lovely waterfall some beautiful um, chambers and some wonderful formations and uh, such uh, unforgettable experience to to be able to drive from your home drive over half an hour and uh, and go into this place that had that has never been seen by human eye uh, it's such such a privilege such an honor and to be honest a life-changing experience to be able to do this kind of stuff for for a man for a young man in his uh, in his late 20s um just caving it offers the one of the last opportunities for people of modest mean to be in modest means to be an explorer you know don't think any of us are going to be going to um everest anytime soon and if we are we're going to be spending tens of thousands of euro to do to, to do an experience that people have done many many times before whereas this is this is true exploration in the in the in the original kind of victorian sense of the word and it's just over the road and there's lots of it uh, yet yet to be discovered a, it's a big blank area on the map and uh, to head off something lee was going to say um i just want to illustrate it with i went to a, what was then the deepest cave in the world back in about 15 years ago uh and it is now no longer the deepest cave in the world. And it, that the cave that has beaten it perhaps will no longer be the deepest cave in the world in a couple of years. And you can say that about many other activities. And I think that's just a wonderful thing, a wonderful aspect of caving as well. It's a, a wonderful age of uh, exploration and discovery uh, and for people with modest means like myself, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, perhaps less visually impressive, but I want to talk a little bit about, about this cave on the left, Alice and Gwendolyn Cave, just south of the Burren innocuous enough looking chamber, but it yielded what is uh, to antiquarians back in the late 19th century, what is up on the right hand side, which is a bare patella with uh, the markings of, uh, of cut marks on it, uh, which was interpreted by Marion Dowd a couple of years ago. And, th and this, this cave pushed back the, the known habitation of humans in Ireland um, by a couple of thousand years, an incredible discovery. So caves are rich in 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 not only uh, not only the, the potential for exploration, uh, which is initially what I would have been interested in them, but also their own their own um, archaeology, their own stories, the folklore associated with them. They're multifaceted, and they they're they're just so so resonant, and they're so multifaceted. It's incredible. And uh, I suppose around around the time that I went in to visit this cave uh, with Marion, it started to go, OK, these these places are extra special. And it's not just about finding more of them for the sake of finding more of them. These are incredible spaces uh, and not to not to ar around the same time. You can see the photograph from the bottom and uh, the bottom right hand side. This was a perforated anther time that a uh, that a couple of cavers um, uh, and myself found up in um, and Monine Mountain. And there's been there's been talks about that in the past for for Burren Bio as well, uh, up in Monine Cave, a spectacular thing to to uncover in a cave. We were only we weren't looking for archaeology. We were looking for um, uh, for uh, for cave past a certain point. Uh, there was there was known to be a small cave there, and we were trying to extend it and started coming across stuff like this. Naively, we kept digging, uh, and eventually we copped on that this was potential archaeology. And uh, yeah, we, it's it's just uncovered this whole other aspect of uh, of caves and a whole new form of respect for them as their repository for such such richness um, that I hadn't even considered. You know, more, not more than a passing interest in archaeology, but when you see when count it like this it it brings it to life in a way that is just impossible and marion has done wonderful talk on that and there's a book on that as well so as time passed and as the as uh, became more interested in not only exploration but the sciencey side of it uh and also the also these, these encounters with the archaeology you see, you kind of take a step back and go hang on a second now how, why are these shapes the way they are they are in a cave why are the passages so formed why are the decorations forming where they are what why does the water sink where it does and why does it drop from a surface river into um into underground uh where where it does and you know 
all these tying all these pieces together will help me find um, likely places to have other caves that are as yet unexplored uh, and all that combined with the, the question of uh, you're, you're starting to encounter and consider the fact that these caves haven't just been used by me or or my friends or, or my club mates uh, for the last couple of years that they've these have been had a multi-layered multi-faceted long 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 history of human usage over the last millennia that, um, say for example uh, there well there's the perforated antler tine in the hands of uh, some fella down the bottom left hand side uh, and on the the top left hand side is an innocuous enough looking um um uh, cave a small very very small cave which was discovered by donald hogan um up in the in the burn uh, two or three years ago and uh, when uh, on first exploration it, it it yielded some incredible uh, results and i don't want to foreshadow that too much because i know marion is going to talk about it at some stage and um, but just to say that's just been huge amounts of stuff that's been found in this tiny little uh, tiny little cave uh, and it's it's uh, it's you know starting early in the late neolithic all the way through early bronze age to to the early medieval and late medieval and and it's just flabbergasting to think that these these places are, are in, in such such use and it's such a such an honor to be able to to encounter them on their own terms you know so as time goes on a richer a richer uh, it just gets richer and more resonant cave in getting to know the caves um so naively what i wanted to do was pull out um say about about 10 years ago i wanted to look at where the longer cave the caves were in the burren to kind of starting to think about it in terms of a landscape level trying to get a grasp on on caves and tie the region together um in, in a kind of a cohesive story just so we can get a get a handle on what what what's happening with the caves why are they forming where are they forming um and these there's, there's an awful lot of caves in the burn. There's about there's about uh, 600 known, we'll call them pals, holes, of which these these are the ones that are longer than 80 meters, which are kind of worth the trip. Often, a lot of caves aren't visited regularly because they're very very short, very short, uh, or they're very difficult to to go into. So. Um, what, what you notice here is the shale, which is the rock that sits atop the limestone, and the caves tend to tend to hug that boundary because the water runs off the shale as a river and then it hits the limestone where it's, it develops a hole big enough um, for people to pass into thus cave. If the water falls directly onto the limestone, it trickles into fissures very small and never really develops into a larger, a larger, uh, larger cave. Perhaps another way of looking at it, caves are drains in the landscape, as we saw with that photograph of uh, Shane getting a face full of water earlier on. And these, the red lines in this are the drains, the mapped center lines of caves. Um, you know, there's a lot of blank spaces here, and that's a wonderful thing. There's a lot of unexplored areas where there's potential for caves. And, um, you know, th these caves have all been mapped pr uh, pretty rigorously and painstakingly. And it's something I, I need to, I've been remiss in, I need to help out with more, more mapping. But you can see, how how they how they drain the landscape uh, and uh, you know they're starting to kind of build this landscape level level picture and i'll just take this moment to give a little plug to the people who are doing all the work um and i'm doing all the talking the clear caving club there's a beginner's trip from a couple of years ago uh so clear caving club is is actively caving beginners there is beginner regular trips and um, i know you've been on one lee and, and there's regular regular um um trips which where beginners are welcome so if you're interested in coming out on your own bat then then uh, do get in touch and um, there's a good mix of amateur science exploration healthy exercise wit and banter and there's some lovely rhodamine dye getting poured into we're doing some dye tracing so there's all this amateur science happening all the time and, and uh, it's wonderful to be part of it so a bit of a busy photograph here and this illustrates um, the water flows in the wider region. I'm not going to try and tie together the whole the whole thing and give you a picture of it. Um, it's it's still complicated to be. I just want to use it to illustrate how complicated the whole network of water flows is in this in the in the the burn and on karst landscapes in general and how fragile in maybe in perhaps in non-karst landscapes with, which have plenty of water issue problems all of their own as we know water quality in ireland is not the best and it's getting worse in some places unfortunately um so rainwater and surface water in in a non-karst environment or perhaps they get the opportunity to filter as they move through soil and subsoil uh through sand and gravel to be to be get get some filtration as they become groundwater and it might have some kind of cleaning action in a karst landscape like this though the, the very, very thin soil and the pervious rock means that what happens on the surface very, very, very quickly 
is uh, drained into the wider landscape and the wider wider uh, groundwater. So the vulnerability to pollution uh, and to water is very, very high and water quality varies widely depending on the rainfall and what activities are happening on the surface at a given time. Pollution spreads fast and it spreads wide but it passes through very, very quickly. So it, it, uh, it varies wildly um, depending on what's happening and what and the time of the year. Say for example, um, some historical fly tipping here, an awful photograph from the left-hand side. And before we, before we get too judgy judgy, remember this is what would have happened for most of history. Things are made of bone, of wood, of leather, uh, perhaps of metal, uh, things that would have biodegraded, biodegraded or would have been inert and people for, nearly all of all of human human uh, civilization and the past would have just thrown stuff away and it wouldn't have done a huge amount of damage perhaps um and it's only in the last 50 years with mass consumerism that uh, and uh, perhaps over specialization and intensification that we're starting to get these kind of modern issues and having to come up with modern solutions to them um so these are some of the issues um agricultural intensification perhaps a point source of pollution slurry spreading which is always tricky to time in the best places the best time is but obviously the risks are even higher in such thin soils and, re and uh, responsive groundwater um you know uh, changes from traditional farming practices uh, damages to damaging to springs perhaps uh, inappropriate forestry plantations upland bog uh, and last but not least septic tanks uh, where perhaps percolation areas aren't in, aren't weren't considered or installed properly uh, combined with the fact that a lot of people get their water from private wells, um, you can imagine there's no filtration of of the of the of water uh, of um, septic water that's coming out and wastewater that's coming out into septic tanks. Um, so these are some of the problems that were faced with uh, with the water quality in the burn and uh, damage damage to caves. Uh, and it's exacerbated by the net network of kind of small scale drainage works that are happening across the landscape in the lowlands, combined with heavier kind of climate, climate, perhaps climate related rainfall events uh, and drought as well as an increasing issue over the past uh, the past years with the lack of kind of water storage. Some of the aquifers and the wells um, perhaps aren't as reliable as they as they used to be. So it's a complex mix of problems. And you can this illustrates very uh, in a nice cross section of what the what potentially if we can imagine the, the the land underneath our feet in a karst landscape looking like this might look nice and green like a normal field like you might see in the Curra, um, but perhaps uh, a little bit more complicated and reactive and uh, vulnerable under the water. So certain things, no magic bullets, of course, farming programs like the Burn program in Acres and it's, it's, it's follower on Acres Burn Iron offer some supports in installing rainwater harvesters and other and supporting nature friendly um, future proofing investments and perhaps financial invest in incentives towards farming in a more extensive traditional nature friendly manner. Uh, nat uh, cave, local cavers supported by the Speleological Union of Ireland, there's a mouthful, the national governing body of caving in Ireland are involved in cave cleanups of historical fly tipping and as well as support supporting awareness, raising trips uh, and giving uh, giving data, showing cave locations to inform future forestry or offering caving trips to connect people with how surface water really works in the caves of the burn. Septic tank remediation is a bit trickier. So I'm going to wrap up. Where does this leave us? Um, what do you what do you see when you look at a landscape like this? I suppose the ancestors of the people who lived here um, said that the white horses of the Xi came out of the cave. That's uh, just about not visible in this. Um, the water pours out after a rainfall events here. Um, reflecting on my own view of it, 20 years ago, I would have seen a place to go on a Sunday for a bit of recreation. Later again, I would have seen a place that was full of potential cave entrances that were waiting for me, waiting to be discovered by me. Later again, I saw a fragile place which is at risk uh, where actions have very, very real consequences on the caves and on the wider region. So what do you see? Do you see a farm maybe which needs a bit of tidying up or clearance? Do you see a place to be abandoned by people and turned into a, a rainforest? Uh, like any good relationship, how we think about the beloved grows and changes. Um, as a man said to me once, I should have been listening, but instead I was talking. Uh, so perhaps listening to the families who live and work here and have lived and work here for generations, if not millennia, and listening to the place itself. Like any good relationship, we try and curb our worst excesses and try and find the compromises where we can.
And so we're back out of the caves. Uh, there's a real appreciation now when you're back out of the cave. Uh, after any caving trip, you get a real appreciation for the openness of the sky, the sun, the stars, and maybe the simple green of a plant that's clinging to a rock face uh, when you come back out into the, into the world. You've enjoyed your trip, but you've also, it's also good to be back. Uh, it's one of those types, types of fun that you have that you kind of reflect on afterwards and go, that was really good fun, as well as having fun at the time. And remember what I said at the start, the most important thing, please, please, please go and get a first-hand experience of a cave. Don't take my word for any of this. Gotta love those caves. And there we are. Thank you very much, Lee, and thanks very much for listening. Thanks so much, Tim. Um, you did a spectacular job of painting the picture of what it would like, what it would be like to, to be in the cave and the uh, serene, peaceful nature of it. Um, so that was great. It might also help that you've taken me into a few caves in uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good. Ireland, it's, so I could just true. go back to those moments. Um, and I have a great memory. We're, we have, we're taking questions as well. So please pop them in. We have one there. Um, I just, yeah, just to know, you said that more, so is the longest, um, one of them is Polnagullum, one of the longer caves. Cause I remember we went into, uh, um, a hotel restaurant in, um, yes, we did. Was, we did. We went into Listun Varna. Yes. The map of the cave and it was like that much had been explored or <laughs> maybe yes. we didn't do that much that day yes you're right you're right yeah um that's right in the in the hotel in listing varna where the original the original explorers from the 1930s excuse me would have stayed in that in that restaurant uh in that uh in that hotel and one of the original the original surveys is there in the, in the hotel and she was proud as punch to say it uh, and and to show us it and this great an, another layer and another piece of continuity uh, of of uh, uh, you know another another piece of cave usage. There's so it's meant so many things to so many different people that it's it's uh, it's lovely to have any any positive associations with them. Um, so yeah, you're right. You're right. That was that was and yeah. You'd still continue to explore, like you said. If if maybe you're not able to get through, would you need permits to maybe? Um, permit permits you you need permits if you're if you're going to go into a cave um for if it's if it has an archaeological monument so um at the moment we're seeking permission to go into one cave to to explore to explore a section of it but it is a national monument so you have to you have to kind of carefully go past that point won't damage that point and then once you get beyond that point you're into kind of uh uh, an area which is which is not not as vulnerable and not as risk and then at that point we can start to hopefully explore and see if we if we're if if we're lucky enough to pull a few rocks out and find new sections of cave and map those up and it might add to the length of it or it might turn into something more substantial and um, so as i said there's large areas of the map that are unexplored so we're trying always trying to get in to see where the water is going to see if those if there's open passages in there it's part of the real appeal to me still the exploration side of it we have one question here. If caves are drains, are there caves under the sea and lake beds? Good question. Um, yes, there is. I, and, and apologies, uh, I'm, I'm not a hydrogeologist. I've been to a couple of talks. David Drew gave an absolutely amazing talk in, in Tober, Tober Hall a few years ago where he linked the whole hydrogeology of the region together, talking about the drainage from the, the Sivakti Mountains off the Kinvara and the Fergus River. And it's just it's wildly complex. And uh, the more you the more you find out, the more bemused you you become and it's it's just incredible you know um but i as far as i know and i hope i'm not mis misrepresenting anything here there's a well out on on in a shear i think it's in a shear it's one of the iron islands and uh, it's fed from uh surface it's fed from the, the water on the mainland so fresh water is falling on the mainland of the burn going underneath the sea and popping up in in the iron island so the level of complexity is incredible and there is some amazing photographs of um subterranean uh, of groundwater brown water uh you get these kind of uh, plumes of brown water out in the in galway bay which is water that's been flushed out from uh from from and that, that kind of comes up underneath the surface of the water there's obviously plenty of cave divers which are exploring new passages from the sea and coming inland and finding finding they're connected with the larger systems inland which are very inaccessible to the likes of me who doesn't go cave diving um but yes the, the level of complexity 
just grows and grows and grows and the uh, and uh yeah yes is the short answer <laughs> and then how very nice um a lot of great comments um paul murphy great talk tim uh brilliant talk tim thanks a million thanks so thanks much. paul thank you fascinating from margaret mcmahon uh thanks very much from tony daddy Didi. don't know um helen sheridan Daddy's says Didi. great insight uh, into what it is to experience a cave thanks helen thank you raymond those photographs somewhere and thanks paul for the use of your photographs you're in there too somewhere thank you and joseph gallagher thanks tim wonderful talk thank um, you yeah that was great and so out of the 600 caves what have you gone into all 600 I have, have i hell <laughs> no way no way no way no way uh no unfortunately not uh yet when it, when i started to look at it and in terms of uh, as a landscape that was that was naively my initial idea was i just wanted to make a very simple map of um of where where the where the caves were where the, where the good the good caves were the classic trips and just just hit all those uh and so no i haven't and even on sunday we were we were we had a short trip on sunday uh, a wonderful trip into powell craig ray and we we were swapping swapping stories about uh caves that we have yet to be in, yet to be in uh there's there's a three kilometer cave up there that that uh, i should i should have been in many times um but have yet to go into and there's plenty more plenty more of them um so yeah no a lot a lot more to do even in, just in terms of tourist trips as we as we call them and um, there's there's a lifetime's worth of worth of uh, visiting there and uh, mm. so no I right. wish. it's another question are so terrains part of the network of caves Suit terrains, they can do. Um, there, there is one. The, the, the oftentimes what you'll find is, uh, and I see Elaine is listening, and she, uh, and I'm sure if she was able to talk, she'd give a better description of this than I am from the archaeological perspective. But uh, oftentimes you'll find um, suit terrains are expanded grikes, which are perhaps a very, very short or narrow cave system where the roof has collapsed uh, or has been re-roofed, or you'll get a, a cave that has been artificially lengthened, a short, dry cave that has been artificially lengthened by putting um, larger larger stones across uh, near the entrance and that kind of extends it or or you can have um suit terrains caves that act as suit terrains um you know you can have short ones there is one valley conry i think it's called near uh, near karen which is effectively just a cave but it is marked as a and the national monuments as a as a suit terrain um so yeah yeah good question and it's 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 the answer is is it varies um, but absolutely natural features would have been completely utilized uh, just because it would have made sense it's less work i guess to uh, just roof something as opposed to as opposed to go um, or use something that's in the landscape already absolutely um, do you think there are many more undiscovered caves in the Burren? I absolutely do. Good question. <laughs> yes, I absolutely do think there's many, many more undiscovered caves in the Burren um, because I have seen firsthand that the most innocuous looking hole um, yields tremendous, uh, very exciting results. And um, I know from from experience as well that the the deepest cave on on the island of Ireland. When you look at it from from the entrance, it was discovered um, by Colin Bunce and Co in the nineteen eighties. Um, and when you look at it from from the entrance, it just looks like what's behind your photograph there, your splash page, Lee. Uh, just an expanded grike. When you and when you go into it, there's a small room that just opens up into this yawning chasm. That's a very very deep cave, and it's just you know you wouldn't from the surface. Uh, um, uh, judge it and there as I said when I showed the hydrological map earlier on or the the map of the the drains or the map of the the spots to show the cave entrance yes there's there's an awful lot of um, places that the water we don't know where it flows <clears throat> or why it flows where where it does the catchments are unclear there's a large body of water that's moving through the landscape um, particularly down the Fergus River cave or even more tantalizingly in, so in certain caves, you can get to a certain point where there's a very, very small, small hole perhaps, and uh, you can feel air, a lot of air coming out, coming out against you. And you know that beyond, beyond that small constriction, there's a larger cave beyond, but just for various reasons, it's very difficult to get in there. It's, you know, you'd have to go in and either start damaging cave, or it's just a very, very long way into the cave that you'd have to come back. Um, so yes, there's more undiscovered caves in the burn. And some of the caves that are existing also have uh, potential discoveries to be found therein. Absolutely. And does the dye, would that, 
you know, would you need just to test, like, is it, how do you know which sample of the dye is now in, in this water sample? Good. Good question. Yeah. So you can do spectral analysis, even on tiny parts. Uh, I don't know if it's, I don't want to say it's parts per million. It's on a tiny, um, it, it shows up even if it's very, very dilute. You can do, you can do analysis on samples and, and we have done, so we found that waterfall that I showed you earlier on in Paul Gonzo, and that has been um, dye traced significantly and uh, more than dye, they've put in all sorts of stuff in, in that to try and figure out where the water ends up in the bay, where does it, where does it flush out, where does it come out? Uh, and uh, there was a lot of uh, sampling and, as I said, amateur science and dye tracing. Um, and you can do um, you can do all sorts of all sorts of tests. And some of it's in, inconclusive, you know, negative is still a, is, is still a result. But um, you can find tiny parts per million and the dye is very safe. Obviously, you know, it, it's not going to it's not going to affect uh, any any fauna or flora in the in the, in the water uh, downstream. But it's a it's a very interesting and striking thing to do and to pour it, pour in a lot of dye into into a piece of water. <laughs> so you would pour it in at a certain location and then you would just drive check. wherever you assume it's going to come check. out take... check further downstream and and yeah yeah you kind of check at different times so you want it the, the speed at which it passes through the system would tell you you know obviously that you know so you'd be checking nearly simultaneously with, with when it's when it's going in and also a kind of a, a, a period after that as well dependent on on uh, on resources and what the recommendations are from the from the experts so there's been an, there's been a good few dye tracing um uh ex experiments and trying to trying to define the catchments which is good as well from a water quality perspective Lee, because you, you can kind of if you can help define where this where, where the catchments are in reality the water starts here and finishes here you know you'll be able to target uh target actions and perhaps help with remediation as well yeah that's great um thanks tim great introduction to the caves of the burn you've convinced me to visit a cave Hey, uh, that's what I want. <laughs> so where would Brian Dowd go to find out more about uh, if he doesn't want to go to Alloway or Doolin? Thanks so much. Yeah, no, I, I definitely want to give um, the Clare Caving Club a plug. Um, I, I gave them a couple of mentions throughout the talk, but it's uh, it's um, reg regular trips. Um, I, I would highly recommend getting in touch via Instagram or Facebook on um, via uh, um yeah, just to look up the Clare Caving Club. It's 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 moderated actively, and uh, we we do we do kind of like tend to bring bring people who are interested in coming caving. Uh, so yeah, if you're in, interested in getting into it as a as a pastime or activity, think about going going with the Clare Caving Club. If it's something you just want to sample and kind of just you're very tentatively looking at it, I think there are some some activity providers. It used to be something we used to, myself and Terry Casterly used to do a million years ago. But um, yeah, get in touch with the Clare Caving Club as your first port to call on Facebook or Instagram is what I'd recommend. And I'm sure, Lee, we can, we can circulate out the details uh, if, if people are looking for it, if they get in touch with you afterwards. And glad, glad to talk to anybody who, and if it's not in the burn, we can put you in touch if you're in a different part of the country. No problem. Yeah, well, that's that's great. Thanks for all the information. And uh, visit Claire Caving Club on Facebook or Instagram. Or yeah, if you don't do social media, um, info at burnbo.com. Um, or email us and we can we can hook you up with with Tim or anyone else in the the caving club. True. True true true. That's it. Excellent. Thanks very much everyone and have a great rest of your evening. Thanks so much Tim. Not a bother. Thanks very much Lee for having me. Pleasure. All right. Bye.